everyone. Uh, welcome to ESG Climate and Money Show. Our today's episode is about energy transition, stewardship, and everything in between. And our guest is Janko, and he is from Fulcrum, which is a hedge fund. But there is another side to him, and that is that he is one of the author of uh, CFA ESG investing uh, syllabus, where he wrote extensively on environment in chapter three. So, Janko, welcome to the show. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sunny. It's a pleasure to join you. Um, so, as you've mentioned, I've been working on different sides of the climate debate and thinking about particularly the role of investors and what investors can do in the fight against climate change and accelerating sustainability. To some degree, I might like perhaps to describe myself as a bit of a corporate vigilante trying to think about particularly the power of investors and shareholders in the companies you invest in and trying to push companies to step up on sustainability. Also more broadly to think about how to create and design low carbon funds and quite importantly, how to collaborate. You know, climate change is a big global issue. It does not work if, if you don't have enough investors who join the table and push for the same things. So between these three things, the client side, communicating with investors, working on funds and companies, I've been fortunate and privileged, I think, to be able to do what I do at a moment when indeed I think there is a sea change in the industry, with particularly with regards to this topic, which is why I think we're having this conversation today. So it's a pleasure to join you. Thank you, Janko. Tell us a little bit about your experience. You wrote a beautiful chapter. Uh, can you, those, of, those people who don't know that, can you tell us about your experience? Um, thank you for the kind words. So uh, importantly, I co-wrote that just for clarity's sake. The CFA Institute has a certificate in ESG investing, which I see a growing number of people, particularly LinkedIn connections, um, taking that exam. Uh, some of which, like yourself, are kind enough to <laughs> say positive words about it. And within that, obviously, one of the biggest topics is around environmental risks. So alongside well, my, my ex-colleague from my previous firm, Xuan Chan, we wrote um, a substantive expansion of that chapter on environmental um, risks and opportunities in investing. We've literally, just a few days ago, I've submitted a new version for the next edition of the exam. And I think the aim we're trying to do there, it's a very hard thing to do because to some level you're trying to be in depth about things. At the same time, you try to cover a lot of ground from some elements around literally the basics of climate science. And as we know, that evolves quite fast. We've just had another round of IPCC reports just over the last few weeks. There's an element of climate science. Then there's an element obviously quite big of regulation and policy that is changing quite fast. And, you know, try to give, give investors, prospective investors, a sense of all the change that's happening. And indeed, perhaps you'll agree with me. We try to put that in the chapter. It's quite striking, isn't it? You know, from <laughs> Australia to Japan. Yeah, I mean, and, and all that uh, jargon and uh, the juice of alphabets, you name it, mumbo jumbo, whatever you want to call it, it's so much to cover in that. And you have done that very beautifully, I must say. I mean, on that, that's, that's pr precisely part of the challenge. I think some people might be put off about the ESG conversation precisely because there, is qu there are quite a few acronyms and... To me, and that's sort of the thing I was coming to, I think another thing we try to do quite purposefully in that chapter is to give a sense that it's much more than just, you know, regulation and reporting and frameworks. It's actually technological disruption is happening, technological innovation is happening, oftentimes at rates that were previously deemed unthinkable, you know, take forecasts from 10 years ago about various technologies, penetrations, rates of renewable energy, other things. And you will see, you know, we might be today where some models said we might be in 10, 50 or even, even more than 100 years, there are some sections of IPCC reports which have renewable penetrations by the end of the century, which we've already passed today. So it's striking how fast the technology is changing and how fast companies are also coming to the table. It's by no means just a regulatory, top-down, bureaucrat-laden initiative, however might, critics might call it. Yeah, I, of course, and this is the early stage still, and of course uh, this this will be rationalized in the future and become more simplified, of course, hopefully. Uh, but uh, let's uh, discuss about our topic for today. The energy sector is an interesting sector because for years we have been think, uh, listening about this uh, renewables coming in and they are going to change the world and blah, blah, blah. The politicians have been talking about uh, this 
And of course, uh, in the last three, four years, people are really kind of from business side are discussing about this, the, the, the funds which incorporated uh, these renewables in, in their uh, portfolio have outperformed in the COVID times. And yeah, it's, it's been a big, uh, big things are happening. But why you think is so that we still have uh, a huge number, uh, a huge percentage of energy still coming from oil and gas, and it is still not going to be uh, renewable um, like the way it should be. Why is that so? Um, well, it's a fascinating question to me, and um, part of the reason why a lot of my work within the within you know stewardship and ESG investing has focused on the energy sector. I think there are probably two sides to that question. One is that there is might al almost say a misleading element to the way these energy statistics are presented. And what I mean by that is this huge gap between primary energy, which is to say, you know, what happens when you literally combust oil, gas, and coal, and how much of it is actually ends up as useful energy. And broadly speaking, for all fossil fuels, around two-thirds of that energy that you burn is not actually captured and used. It's actually wasted. You know, that's why, to choose one example, that's why the engine in your car gets hot if you have a petrol car. That energy is not translated to the wheels of the car, it's literally dissipated as heat. So there is an element which is just about framing. When you often see statistics that are suggesting, you know, for example, the share of renewable energy as a measure of primary energy has not changed substantially over the past 20 years, it's partly because so for thermodynamic reasons, you know, the, f the fossil fuel combustion system is in itself inefficient. So there's that one challenge. If you look under the hood, and this is where I think it starts to become much more interesting, if you don't just look at overall use, you know, does the world still continue to use oil, gas, and coal? Sure, absolutely, at staggering rates, and even sadly, as we've seen with following COVID and now the response, it's actually at growing rates in certain places. That said, if you first look um, under the hood and use the right comparator, so for renewable energy, the right metric is not energy overall, it is electricity at the moment. Solar and wind, other technologies are primarily used to generate power, not other forms, not heat, for example, or other things. So when you look at that, already you see quite a dramatic um, dramatic change in that. So I have one, one number I'd like to quote to you. Just this, this year, in last year, wind and solar generated a tenth of global electricity for the first time. That has grown quite rapidly. More importantly, a different dynamic linked to this idea of the right comparator. Uh, take the first derivative, not absolute levels of usage, but growth, changes in growth. Where does demand, for new demand for oil, gas, or coal, new demand for power, where do those come from? And if you look at the numbers, for example, um, last year, 81% of all the new power capacity that was added globally was indeed renewables. So, you know, the new demand for electricity, a significant growing part of that is actually being met by renewables. Same for a part of transport, which is very important. So take car sales. Of course, you need to look, if you look out the window, we can probably see uh, more petrol cars than electric vehicles. But in terms of the growth in car sales, and I'm talking passenger vehicles here, so small cars, all the net growth last year, according to the International Energy Agency, came from electric vehicles. So that conversation, I think, is one fascinating element of this dynamic. At which point is all the new demand for energy, and I'm talking about energy here, not just electricity, at what point does that start to become met by, you know, proportion of primarily low carbon energy sources? Because that is a tipping point in a way, right? It points to the point at which you start to see overall fossil fuel demand start to peak, plateau, and eventually decline. Now, that's not to say this is a fast process, as you're saying. It's a challenging and lengthy one, and indeed perhaps an underappreciated fact that, you know, even in so-called net zero scenarios, like from the International Energy Agency, by 2050, oil and gas, and to some degree coal demand, is not zero. So it's an underappreciated fact that this transition in certain places is happening faster than expected, in other places it's much harder to do. Um, but I think we should be wary of just, you know, taking one set of metrics or one view on this thing. It actually varies quite a lot by sector, by region, by technologies. And depending on where you look, I think it's exactly a case of glass half full or glass half empty. Or, you know, atmosphere half full of greenhouse gases or half empty, depending mm. on how you want to look at it. Yeah, that's a nice way to put it. Of course, this is an ongoing process. And uh, right now we can think about there is uh, half 
glass full of water. So there is a hope. So uh, moving further, what what do you think? You are sitting in this industry, uh, and what is the situation with this conflict going on in uh, Ukraine? Uh, this is really, uh, in a way, I would say, have put people on the back foot uh, because those those energy, those oil companies, which were the evil ones, now we are asking them to produce more, um, and. How do you see that? How do you how how people should balance this uh, this approach? Uh, because if we, we were previously talking about that, if we don't uh, trans uh, do this transition fast enough, we are going to have problem. But now we are certainly seeing that we are asking these oil companies to produce more oil, um, and then I think we are delayed in our net zero. Uh, goals. What, what do you think about this type of dilemma? I think dilemma is the right word. I mean, if we were just to briefly step back, you know, I don't subscribe, subscribe to the view of the evil oil companies. I know you meant it perhaps tongue in cheek, you know. Um, I mean, we have face masks, hand sanitizers. Everyone thinks of, um, you know, oil and gas and greenhouse gases, but few people think about some of the other contributions of the uh, petrochemicals industry in particular, which is ultimately still oil and gas, right? Um, I mean, that's a small pandemic related example that it's by no means how it's sometimes presented and particularly on the more activist spectrum of things. Um, with regards to big issue you're mentioning, I mean, it's clear that I think, you know, the policy response is indicative of that, but also sort of sen citizen sort of sentiment, you know, that the social dimensions and the humanitarian implications of this conflict have risen to the forefront and to some degree i mean necessarily have to take priority over the slightly more long-term dynamics around climate change i think it seems if you look around at the response that seems to be the implied sort of value judgment there whether or not though wh where the cards land longer term i think is still a big question up for debate because as you're saying you know the first immediate response is everyone would like to move away from putin's fossil fuels but the end game, I think, is to move away from fossil fuels altogether. And it's not immediately clear to me whether or not, indeed, the slightly, some of the slightly longer term measures that have been accelerated now by the pandemic, you'll witness, for example, you know, Germany's plans to speed up some of its um, shift to 100% clean electricity. There are other things being rolled out now, and I think that may well accelerate the transition to net zero not even though as you're saying some of the you know ramp up in emissions some of the potential growth in oil and gas production and even coal demand all that might be setbacks temporarily but at the same time i think the pandemic the, sorry not the pandemic the, the conflict in ukraine has made very clear more visible to people the idea of um, the volatility of commodity prices being exposed to that, um, you know, particularly nations who are heavy oil importers like India, I think, are very acutely aware of that. At the same time, the idea of energy independence and reliance and how that interacts with the concept of, for example, distributed renewable energy. There are all these things which are starting to bubble more to the surface. And indeed, uh, you know, who, who, no one has a crystal ball, but I do say it's not by no means clear that it's just a setback. It could well accelerate the transition to net zero. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and, and then there is another, uh, of course, I, I can say the evil energy companies in inverted commas, because that is the what, what we hear on the mainstream uh, media sometimes. But, but when it comes to dealing with these companies, and there are also, uh, there is a big debate, of course, in this, uh, this uh, ESG sector, that should people be engaging with these companies? Should there be divestment? Uh, should there will be a kind of engagement or what should be the right approach and how you you and your firm are approaching this uh, issue. Uh, I can quote a little bit because here in uh, Norway, we have a huge wealth, uh, the wealth fund. And at some time on the news, there are talks like that. Oh, look at this wealth fund. Oh, they are really still investing there, blah, blah, blah. So, so there is a huge uh, debate on this thing. So how do you approach this problem? Well, thank you for your question. I mean, I, I think it's important to separate a few issues here. One, perhaps the debate around engagement versus divestment, and we've been seeing this for, you know, the more than a decade, perhaps, or even more so, I think to some degree is a false alternative. 
I've seen in um, I've seen I've seen my career career so far the idea that the threat of divestment if it's done targeted or more broadly the threat of sanctions it could be investors calling out a company in public it can be investors you know speaking to the press speaking to other investors voting against directors trying to change board seats we've had a very dramatic example of that at exxon mobil in short the idea that engagement for engagement to work there needs to be some sort of stick some sort of potential sanction i think that's important so done strategically there is potentially a role for divestment in that sense but mind you what i'm thinking primarily of here is not oh we're divesting because you're an oil company it's we're divesting because you're not keeping up with your oil company peers which is a subtly different but very important nuance right so both within fulcrum i'm literally just about to send out our latest letters to boards um to ask the companies we've selected to set science-based targets and you know to step up their climate strategies so both within fulcrum and within my previous role at a large uk asset manager who's a leading shareholder in many of these companies i have seen that companies do respond to engagement and there have been changes and to give just one example in the energy sector um i mean if you maybe just a bit, bit of context for myself so i spent a few years with um, i was fortunate enough to work with the pioneering think tank called carbon tracker who first introduced the idea of stranded assets you know this concept that there might be fossil fuels that might need to be left in the ground or more broadly certain kinds of infrastructure high carbon infrastructure projects that may not deliver the return you expected them to do for various reasons cheaper technologies early retirements broader things now when carbon tracker was first writing about that the response was what stranded assets there's no such thing Fast forward a few, a few years later, and literally the concept shows up in impairment decisions from certain oil majors when they say certain kinds of their reserves might no longer be developed. So that's changed in terms of the context. In terms of engagement, more specifically as a shareholder, you, I have seen within the last few, say, five years that I've been engaging with energy companies, how much that conversation's moved. Whereas a few years ago, you'd have companies who wouldn't even refuse to disclose their total carbon footprint, you know, for listeners who are clued in, I'm, I'm sure, no doubt, uh, the people who listen to this podcast are, that would be particularly scope three emissions that are released when you're burning your oil and gas. So if a few years ago, companies wouldn't even disclose their footprint, let alone set targets, I think we've now seen companies start to disclose, then start to set targets for their operations, then start to set net zero targets for their operations, then start to set net zero targets for their entire footprint, which includes the products that they sell. That shift would have been unthinkable, I think, a few years ago. And now it, you are starting to see it. It's almost becoming norm, at least for certain kinds of large oil companies. And there, I think there's no doubt that it's partly in investor engagement and pressure. That was a major factor in this. Not the only one, of course. You've had Extinction Rebellion and you know activism. You've had policy, but there's no doubt to me that engagement works, but that you do need also to be, um, you know, to have a potential stick there. And voting is very important. You know, within within Fulcrum, for example, we have a climate policy which informs our votes, which is purposefully chosen to be stronger on climate issues compared to the standard sort of house view that you get from proxy advisors. And that means, you know, we're, in, we're voting against directors because we might think they're not, um, you know, discharging their duties as regard to, you know, um, prudence or fiduciary duties more broadly, specifically on the topic of climate change. We might be voting against the pay packages of directors if they're not in appropriately motivated or remunerated to think about certain material ESG topics. So all, the, all this, I guess, is a very long-winded way of saying you, you need to be using all the toolkits at your mm -hmm. disposal. Yeah, so this is the, the nutshell. Like you say that engagement is the best way still in a, in a way. I mean, I think I think that's that's true because obviously, I mean, there's there's one question around what you're trying to achieve here, and it's not always clear that mm. um, selling shares has an immediate impact on company strategy. Having said that, I think there's also a little bit the the case is sometimes a little bit overplayed in my personal view when people say, "Well, we can't just divest." Well, yes, equally, you don't always have an obligation to hold everything. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, it really depends on the case to case. And if they are exactly. if they are agreeing on the targets and they are being nice, so why not continue? So, yeah, but exactly. fantastic. And uh, it, it has been uh, we're moving to the last part. And those people who don't really who, who want to get in contact with you, how can they con get in contact and get to know more about what Fulcrum is doing? Uh, can you tell us? 
Well, I mean, I, if, if you will indulge me, I would like to say a little bit about what we're doing, then share about some of the context. I think some of the work that we've been doing has focused quite strongly on two things. What is the investment thesis around climate change? All these things that we're talking about, right? There are all these approaches. You could be doing things at, the, at one extreme end from sort of philanthropic reasons. It's nothing, it's just to do with impact, not so much to do with investments. We here at Fulcrum believe that with regards to the climate cr challenge, there is investment opportunity and risk. Both are very significant. And indeed, to be an early mover into companies which are aligning themselves to the goals of the Paris Agreement, we see investment opportunity in that, and we've built um, a solution to try and tackle that. Now, the question is, how do you measure that? And this is where I think we come to an important philosophical question, which is this idea of alignment, in particular what's sometimes called temperature alignment, which is basically the idea that a company's carbon emissions today are in no means, you know, 100% indicative of where they might be in the future. So we need to think about how business models might change with targets companies are setting. You know, some high carbon companies today will no doubt they still be needed in the future. Mining's the best example. So there's a lot of work internally that we've been doing on trying to decide which methodologies to use with how to bring in this idea of forward-looking metrics into fund construction and also how to collaborate with other investors on this because as you're, as we're all aware it's it's still a nascent area so we're we're joining a number of initiatives including under the what's known as gfans the global glasgow financial alliance for net zero we're working with other luminaries in this space on trying to do to think about methodologies for alignment so that's a little bit of an intro and in terms of anyone who hopefully will be interested by what we've talked today i mean um i'm both on linkedin and people can contact me also at yanku.darimus at fulcrumasset.com thank you very much uh, yanko this was fantastic to have you today on the show i hope like me other people will also learn a lot from this thank you very much thank you it was a pleasure to join you thank you for the invitation thank you